Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Are you happy you came to church today? Yes. Amen. So am I. I want to tell you that it is not by coincidence you are here. It is by the work of the Holy Spirit and by God. So I want to, I know there has been already a welcome, but just welcome you again to the Cleburne First Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I know that we have special visitors and guests among us, and I just want to give a special welcome to our own president's, uni university's presidents, excuse me. Uh, Dr. Shaw is here visiting with us. Amen. Now forgive me if I don't see you at this moment, but there you are. God bless you. God bless you and thank you for coming. And may God bless his schools, his institutions, his education. These, are, these, are, these all belong to God. And God will take care of it and God will bless it as we are told that God blesses his schools. Let's begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the many rich blessings that you pour out every day on every single one of us. And Lord, we just, I, I want to ask that your Holy Spirit may penetrate every single heart here and that your voice, your spirit may be heard and not mine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Before I continue, I just want to extend to every single one of you here. Some of you may be traveling, some of you may be visiting or may be receiving. But from my part to, you, to your heart, I hope you have a happy and safe Merry Christmas. And that you may have a good time with your family and that you not only spend time with your family, but you spend time with the Lord. You spend time with the Lord. Okay, we're going to see here that God was looking for people looking for him and he didn't find them. The four pillars of the Christian life that I think main essential pillars that a Christian must be to be a Christian are Bible study, you got to study the Bible if you're going to confess to be a Christian. Amen? Prayer. You need to spend time in communication with God. Worship. You need to spend time in worshiping Him. And Christian service. You need to serve Him. Serve Him. Witness to Him in one way or another. We need to be serving our Lord. And today I want to take you to the first Christian witnesses. To the first Christian witnesses. And unfortunately and disturbing, God's church, God's people, or most of God's people, I should say, have fallen short to God's expectations when it comes to witnessing. God's people, most of God's people, have fallen short to what God expects when it comes to witnessing. We, we enjoy it. We enjoy the truth that we know but we just have a hard time in sharing it with others. You see, when the Messiah was gonna be born, as, you read, as we read here in Luke chapter two, when the Messiah was gonna be born, the first people that God entrusted with that message were shepherds, unchurched, uneducated shepherds. Have you ever thought, thought, stopped and thought, why did God first entrust the message that he was coming with shepherds? Why didn't he go to the church, to, to Jerusalem? And we know that the coming of Jesus was planned before time, before the beginning. In Revelation 13, 8, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God was slain from the foundations of the world, the Bible tells us. So from the very beginning, Christ's coming was already planned. And from studying Genesis 3:15 and Isaiah 7:14, the plan was prophesied as well. The plan was prophesied. People had studied the Bibles and should have known that the Messiah was coming. That the Messiah was coming. 
Galatians 4, 4 tells us there, But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son born of a woman. Everything was planned out for Christ's first coming. For Christ's first coming. And God's people should have been ready. And should have been ready with their arms open, their knees bent, to welcome the Messiah, the Son of God. But the night Christ was born, God's people should have been ready. And we can get the first slide there ready that I want to share with you. Instead of coming to the shepherds, he should have came, he should have came to the church. I really encourage you to read chapter 3 in Desire of Ages. It's called The Fullness of Time. The Fullness of Time, chapter 3. Go home this evening and read the whole chapter. And Desire of Ages here gives us several insights, several insights regarding the, the, the coming of Jesus. One of them, one of them is that the scriptures had been translated already. Now, in Jesus' days, the common language was Greek. The common street language was Greek. And the Hebrew scriptures, which, is, which was all that they had at that time, had already been translated to Greek. Sometimes it's known as the Septuagint. I'm sorry. No, yes. And people should have been able to read the Old Testament in reading it in Greek, in their own common language. And we're told that here. For hundreds of years, the scriptures had been translated into the Greek languages, then widely spread throughout the Roman Empire. Did, did people have an excuse of not getting into the scriptures? No. You don't have to know Hebrew. I'm sure maybe many of the Jews knew Hebrew as well. But even those who didn't and knew the common language and knew how to read, the scripture was available to them. The scripture was already available to them. And so the prophecies of Isaiah were uh, available to them. And the coming of the Messiah, the knowing of that, was available to them. Something else that we are told in this chapter is that humanity had become so degraded that human bodies were worked by demons. You see, when Jesus came, he came right on time. He came right on time. Satanic agencies, there in the Desire of Ages, page 36, satanic agencies were incorporated with men. The bodies of human beings made for the dwelling, of, dwelling place of God had become the habitation of demons. The senses, the nerves, the passions, the organs of men were worked by supernatural agencies in the indulgences of the vile lusts. The vile lusts. The very stamp of demons was impressed upon the countenances of men. Human faces reflected the expressions of the legions of evil with which they were possessed. With which they were possessed. The human race was at the lowest point. And this is the time when Jesus comes. At this time. People were... I'm sure there were more demon-possessed people than what we read in the Gospels. But here, the human race was at the lowest point, and the timing was perfect for Jesus to come. What a better time when it's the worst time on earth. So don't miss that, friends. Just when you think that the devil is winning, he has the upper hand, he has everyone being possessed by his angels, Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up. Whenever you think that the devil has the upper hand in your life and you cry out to God, Jesus will show up. Jesus will come. So here in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, if you open your Bible there, verses 8, verse 8, now Jesus is going to come. And there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of 
the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Amen. Amen. Here the angel comes before to the shepherds and gives them the good news. And behold, that which was prophesied is, is being fulfilled. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And then, verse 13, many other angels show up and sing and give glory to God for the coming of His Son. God shared the message, though, with shepherds. Have you ever stop and ask yourself why did he go to the shepherds why not to the priests to the Pharisees well thank God for the testimony of Jesus praise the Lord because the testimony of Jesus here tells us in Desire of Ages page 43 and 44 okay so really really pay attention to this if you want to you can follow along with me angels came to the land of the chosen people to the land where the glory of God had been revealed and the light of prophecy had shown the angels came so where is that place where is that land that the angels first came to Jerusalem, Jerusalem the chosen the, the chosen place they came unseen to Jerusalem to the appointed expositors of the sacred oracles and the ministers of God's house so something's wrong now. Because the Bible here, we read Luke 2, verse 8. They went to who? The shepherds on the country fields. And here, the testimony of Jesus tells us that angels went to Jerusalem first. To those who hold the sacred oracles. The ministers of God's house. Who are the ministers of God's house? Priests. priests high priests. Scribes. It continues saying... Already to Zacharias the priest as he ministered before the altar the nearness of Christ's coming had been announced. We, do we remember that? When Zechariah was in the temple and the announcements of John the Baptist came to his father, father that you will have a son. So there the angel came to Jerusalem and he found the priest doing his job and he announced to him he is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Okay, so this had already happened. An angel had shown up to Jerusalem to Zacharias. The Jewish nation had been preserved as a, as a witness that Christ was to be born of the seed of Abraham and of David's line, yet they knew not that his coming was, not, was now at hand. How could that be? How could they not know that his coming was now at hand? So the angels, what we read earlier, had gone first to Jerusalem. And it continues saying, In the temple, the morning and the evening sacrifices daily pointed to the Lamb of God. Yet even here was no preparation to receive Him. Those have to be one of the, of the saddest words that you read. Every day, every single day, every single morning, every single evening, every sacrifice pointed to the coming Messiah. And the job of the priest was to tell people one day, one day, the real Messiah, the real Lamb of God is going to come. And every day they did this, they were still not ready for him. They Notice how pathetic this is. They rehearsed their meaningless prayers and perform their rites of worship to be seen by men but in their strife for riches and worldly honor they were not prepared for the revelation of the Messiah they were not prepared so what does God do 
He goes to the right place, Jerusalem, his people, his priests. If anyone knew the scriptures should have been the priests and the scribes. So what does he do? Only a few were longing to behold the unseen. To these, heaven's embassy was sent. Who were these few? The shepherds. The shepherds. The, the angels started by going to Jerusalem. Now the angels don't know the future. And they might be expecting people they're waiting. And sadly, nobody's waiting. No one is studying the prophecies. No one's knowing, hey, the prophecy is almost going to be fulfilled. No? On the contrary, what did we read? They were rehearsing their meaningless prayers and rituals, just like a routine. The priests were basically playing church. And so what did the, what did the angels do? They went somewhere else. They went searching and who had an interest for the coming Messiah? Who was interested? Who was looking for Jesus coming? If we put it in common language today, it would be as if the angel came now to the general conference and is looking for people studying about the Messiah. And he gets there to the general conference and the angel sees nothing. Now he goes down to, to the unions. They're too busy. He goes down to the conference. They're too busy. In the quote here, they went to the temple as well. So the angel from coming from, 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 coming from the general conference, the union, the conferences, comes to the Cleburne church where people praise the Lord. And what does the angel find here when in the first coming of Jesus in the temple? People, priests, playing church. People, playing church. Bringing their sacrifices without a search of the Messiah. Without true repentance. Without true conversion. They came to the church, to the temple, and did not even find a cracked Bible. Oh, friends. May God not find that when he comes to this church. Amen. The angels were so desperate, they went out and they found shepherds. They're looking for the Messiah. They're looking for the Messiah. Only a few were longing to behold. Are we longing for Jesus' second coming? These shepherds were longing, and the angels said, Ha, there, we will go announce it to them. We will go announce it to them. Jerusalem missed the angels' message. The temple missed the angels' message. And the reason why they missed it, they couldn't find anyone looking for it. The message looking for the, the Messiah they were occupied with their routine they were occupied with their routine no one was excited about them about the Messiah's coming nobody was excited there was only two groups of people that were excited the wise men and the shepherds both unchurched and yet God revealed to them the good news Friends, we have to get excited again. Amen. We have to get excited again. Yes, it has been a while and maybe people have said, oh, but we've preached so long that, the, that Jesus is coming again. So long? Not even 400 years is so long. The Jewish people waited more than 400 years for Christ's first coming. We, we've waited how long? 100, my math is not good right now, what, one? I'll give you 200 years, 200 years, half of that. And we're still complaining that God has taken too long, friends. We need to get excited again. Is there something to get excited about being a Seventh-day Adventist? Yes. I hope so, friends. If not, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? There is plenty of reasons to get excited about being a Seventh-day Adventist. 
I'm a Seventh-day Adventist not because I was born into the, the, into the Seventh-day Adventist church, although I was born into the Seventh-day Adventist church, but I am excited because of the truth that the church has, yes. the jewels that the church has, friends. There are people out there praying to know what you know right now. Shepherds shouldn't have been at the manger. The chief priests, the high priests, should have been at the manger. All of Jerusalem should have been at the manger. But instead, there were shepherds. So how about Cleburne? Can God find anyone excited about his second coming in Cleburne? I hope so, friends. I hope so. These shepherds became the first Christian witnesses. Because once they got the news and they became excited, there in 17 and 18, chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, now, when they had seen him, who is a him? The angels. They got the news. What they were longing for, as we read, what they were longing for had now been fulfilled. They made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. Concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. In verse 20, Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Friends, many things have been told to you, many things you have studied and searched out in the scriptures, but are we like these shepherds? We go out wildly and sharing it of the good news that we have. Of the good news that we have. Because of the excitement of the shepherds, they witnessed, they testified. They began witnessing. The issue wasn't whether somebody would believe them. No. They just got a witness of what they saw, of what they had learned, of what they had already studied and now being fulfilled. You see, that's what a witness is. It's a person who gives a testimony of an experience they have had. Of an experience they have had. If you haven't had an experience with Jesus, there's nothing you can witness about. The first thing you need to do is find Christ at the cross. Accept his word, accept his message, and then you, once you have experienced him, you have something to share with others. You have hope to share with others. Others who may be sad for whatever reason, maybe a loved one died, well, do we have hope there? And not just hope of a resurrection, even good news. Don't worry, your loved one is not suffering at all. There's good news. There's good news in every single doctrine of the, of the church. Every single one. And I think there are several things that keep us from witnessing. I'd like to share a couple of them. One of them is we might have some unresolved issues with God. You see, sometimes we don't understand why God allows certain things. Why did God allow this? I thought God would under hear my prayer. Why did God? And we may wrestle with things that God allows. And we have unresolved issues. And with those unresolved issues in our minds, and instead of accepting it by faith, we kind of maybe have a hard time witnessing when we're still doubting. Well, is God really here? Because we don't understand how he works. Friends, we don't have to understand how God works in every single detail. Sometimes we have a hard time witnessing because we forget that it's good news and not just, just news. It's good news. It is good news. Thank God that Jesus is coming again. That's good news. The way the world is going, it, if he doesn't come, 
Is it, is, is it even worth being here 20 or 30 or 50 years or 100 years? In the condition that this world is going, thank God he's going to come again and do away with this evil and recreate and give us a new world. Thank God for the good news that when someone does die, that, that is a blessed news that they are, we can say, in a coma, in, in a sleeping state where they're neither... Re How can you even rejoice looking down at this evil world? Thank God no one is suffering and burning anywhere. Thank God that Jesus is in the sanctuary right now in heaven doing something for you and for me. If he would have come before that, we'd all be lost. But he's interceding for us. He's cleansing our heart. It's not just enough to be forgiven. He wants converted people in the kingdom of God. Changed people in the kingdom. I accept his forgiveness. Praise the Lord. Every day we should all accept his forgiveness. But every day we should ask God to cleanse our heart and convert us and change us every day to, more, to be more like him. Thank God of the Sabbath. Praise the Lord. There's so much we can say about that. Another, another reason why I think it's hard for us to be a witness is that I think we have forgotten that we are different. We have forgotten that we are different. We are different, church. We are different. If there is anything that my mom always kept on repeating over and over and over, is Harley, you're different. You're different. Whenever I would go out to my friend, Harley, don't forget, you're different. Whenever anything. I, ha I, I had the opportunity or the experience of getting both a public and a private education. And whenever I went to a public school, my mother would always, every single day before I got on that bus, don't forget, Harley, you're not like them. I can still hear that voice right here. You're different. Remember who you are. You are a Seventh-day Adventist boy. You're different. And even when I did go to a private academy, an Adventist, uh, an Adventist academy, I thought, oh, okay, mom's going to kind of lay it off a little bit now. No? <laughs> even more, Harley, you're different. Even though you are among your own faith, you're still different. And to be honest, friends, it is harder to be a Seventh-day Adventist in an Adventist education than in a public education. Amen. It is more challenging. You see, in the public schools, I knew that if they didn't understand why I didn't go to the football games on Friday or why I wouldn't uh, smoke or why I wouldn't do things I shouldn't be doing in the back of the seat with my girlfriend, I understood that if they didn't get it, I knew because they were unchurched people. They didn't believe in God. They didn't care. So in my mind, I'm like, well, of course, they're not going to understand. I'm different. But when you're in the context of, of boys and girls that believe and think the same, and sometimes those same actions are also seen there, it's harder <laughs> to say, mm, what are we doing? Why are we doing that? You're even kind of looked at silly. But we have forgotten, friends, that we are different. Seventh-day Adventists think different, eat different, look different, respond different. Everything is different about Seventh-day Adventists. A person should be able to see, a stranger should be able to see a Seventh-day Adventist Christian and by their talk or by their behavior recognize there's something different about you. There's something different about you. Normally somebody would get mad. Normally somebody would, would curse off that person. There's something different about us. And sometimes we forget that we are different. And it's hard for us to be witnesses for God. We forget that our convert, that our con, our conversion, that our conversion was a miracle. Saving you was not easy. Amen. Saving me, I know, was not easy. And so we, we, we forget that others, we think that others will, save, be, will, will be saved so easily. 
The Holy Spirit can work and work and work, but it's still up to the person to make that choice. Still up to the person to make that choice. And I just think that we lack a love for people. We just lack a love for people. And these things hinder our witnesses, our witnessing, our witnessing. But church, I just want to invite you to turn to Revelation chapter 7. Once again, there are angels flying. This time, they're not looking to see who they're going to share the good news of the first coming of Jesus. There are angels flying and they are sealing God's people. They are sealing those who have spent time with him, look for him, are studying his word, have committed to him. Revelation 7, verse 1 through 3. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, beholding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. Amen. Friends, if you want to know where we are prophetically, this is exactly right now where we are at this time. December 20th, 20th, right? 20th, 2014, Revelation 7, 1 through 3. This is where we are right now. God is sending out his angels, sealing his people. And thank God, here where it says, do not harm the earth yet. Do not wait. Just wait. Why wait? Why? Why? I thank God that he didn't come three years ago. My brother-in-law wouldn't have been in, that, in the saved group. There are still people, friends, that God knows, oh, I just give me a little bit more time with that person, I can still, they can still turn to me. God is waiting, not because he's waiting the earth to get worse, more people to die of cancer, more children to die, more hurricanes, more, no, no, no. God is fed up with that. The only reason why he is longing is because he is waiting for people to decide. Some haven't, haven't ever made the choice and he wants to give them the opportunity. God is also waiting for those who have left that they may come back to him. Those who have left the church, that they may return to the fold. Praise the Lord. And as, as these angels are flying, friends, will God find people in Cleburne searching for his second coming? Will he find Cleburne witnessing for his second coming? How will the angel find you? My prayer is that he will not find you how he found Jerusalem, how he found the temple, plain church, when he came the first time. My prayer and supplication is that he finds you faithful, searching, so that he may put his seal upon you and be counted among the righteous and be counted among the saved. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. This church isn't ready. Jesus is coming soon, friends. Amen. And we are too occupied sometimes with things of life. There is nothing wrong with celebrating the Christmas season and shopping and exchanging gifts, friends, but what does the, what does the majority of your time is being spent on? Witnessing, letting others know, hey, this world's going to end soon. That same Jesus that we are celebrating of his birth, he's coming again that's the second time. And sharing with others the blessed hope that we have, friends. And I just want to pray and invite you, invite you, that like these shepherds, 
who long for the Messiah, that we long for Christ's second coming. And as we long for it, that means we share with it. Because you know, Christ isn't going to come unless other people know. And if, we, and if we want him to hurry up, we need to hurry up. We need to hurry up. Friends, may God bless you. May God richly, richly bless you. And may he convert you every single day to be a witness for him. To be a witness for him. That's my desire and my prayer. How many have that same desire? Amen? Amen. Friends, if it's your desire, I invite you to stand as I want to pray for you. That we go tell it on the mountain, just how we're going to sing. That we spend time with Jesus. If you do not know Jesus, there's nothing you can witness about. If you don't, have, if you don't know Jesus, get to know him today. Today. And begin to share others what Jesus has done for you. Father in heaven, my God, you are coming so very soon. Sometimes it seems that your church is occupied in other things. Is occupied in, in many things. But in studying your word. In sharing your word. Lord, forgive us. Lord, forgive me when I have been slow to share, hesitant to share, embarrassed to share. And I ask you that you give us that boldness, that message just how you gave these shepherds. That they went out in sharing and were the first witnesses. We want to be the last witnesses. We are the last witnesses for a dying world. So Lord, I leave your people here. This congregation belongs to you. Please shake them and wake us all up to be witnesses for you and to share the good news of your soon second coming. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.